California. So if you're on the Golden Gate Bridge going north of San Francisco, okay. about 45 minutes. Okay. And then the diocese stems from, so that's, exa that's exactly where Santa Rosa is, but the diocese starts about 20 minutes south of that in Sonoma County, so basically wine country, and then goes from wine country, Napa, Sonoma counties, up the California coast, all the way to the Oregon border. And so, all right, welcome, 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 welcome. How do you build a culture? Um, it has nothing to do with uh, 50 extra swings, 100 <laughs> extra ground balls, or a, a, a thousand extra PFPs. Build a relationship with the fellow. First of all, if you're a major league player, if this major league player is legitimately supposed to be there, he's good. He's good. He's a good player. He's a good athlete. So what do you do to make this group better as a whole that makes you better than these other teams that come in on a consistent basis? I think it's about building relationships first. And once that happens, then me and you trust each other. Once we trust each other, now we can exchange thoughts and ideas. Until we trust one another, you're going to push back at my thoughts, and I'm going to push back at yours. But once you've achieved that, now here's the real rub, and this is what makes it all work. Then you can be constructively critical of each other, and then something good occurs after that. Hey but guys. if you don't accomplish those first three steps, that doesn't happen, and then you don't have culture. You don't have chemistry. You don't have any of that because you're always pushing back at one another. So for years, for me, whether it's in a... Uh, an industry or a, a factory or a, whatever, a law firm or a baseball clubhouse, if you fail to address those things first, if you get chemistry and if you get uh, culture, you're kind of lucky. But believe me, man, it's, it's there to be done. It can be done. All right, friends, uh, I'm switching over screens. Everett, you see yourself now with more hair? Yes. All right. Uh, so... Nancy, thanks for rejoining us. Michael, Rachel, welcome. Uh, last night we talked a little bit uh, about Joe Madden and the culture, the, the new winning culture of the Cubs and how you create culture. Uh, this is Everett Fritz and his book, The Art of Forming Disciples, for those that have their camera up and can see this. Uh, I've read, inspired me a couple of years ago, spent some time with Everett, and I think Everett has was a relationship born and then trust created and then we were able to back and forth one another over coffees and, and breakfasts and, and here we are so uh last night we spent uh, everett presented spent some time kind of looking at a ten thousand foot view of how we change culture uh change the mindset of youth ministry to present day and, and what that means and today we'll be focused a little bit more on the practical and then the father and the son and the holy spirit with the help of the most blessed Virgin Mary, may we learn to use our time as the treasure it is and make effort to improve in the virtue of order so as to work more punctually, intensely, and constantly without disorder or delay. May we achieve this by following a well-structured plan, which allows us to spend the appropriate amount of time on each of our duties, our spiritual life, our family life, our professional life, and our social relations. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Everett, I'm handing over the joystick to you. Great. Uh, so last night I talked about um, my own process as, as a youth minister, uh, 15 years in youth ministry, how I had built massive youth groups uh, and found that uh, they were not uh, getting to the level of success that I wanted to. When we actually measure, when I actually measured success, I found that most of the young people coming out of the youth group, even though we had big numbers and lots of participation and a lot of energy, uh, it, it wasn't creating lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ. It was only those who came through small group ministry that uh, that became lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. And so we changed our youth ministry to entirely focus in on on small groups where we had adult mentors uh, who would pour into a handful of young people for a long period of time. And those young people would be in a small group with their friends. And uh, occasionally we'd bring all the small groups together for large activities, but we actually found that our attendance uh, skyrocketed. Um, so we, we already had a large youth group and our youth ministry in terms of number of young people we were reaching doubled, but even more so, we were retaining young people freshmen through senior, which a lot of times seniors tend 
to drop off. Uh, and then we would follow them into college and found that they were still active Catholics. And now I've been doing this style of, of ministry for uh, all, close to 10 years. And that's been consistent in every uh, ministry that I've worked with. When we do small groups, we retain our young people. Now, why does that work? Um, there is uh, just real briefly, because I, I, I don't, I only got about 20 minutes. So I want, I want to get into practicals, but why is it that a, a small group ministry is so much more effective than any other paradigm or method of ministry that is currently being used with young people. You could say this of any person. Uh, there is a um, famous uh, theory of psychology known as the hierarchy of needs that was developed by Abraham Maslow. And in that, uh, in his theory of psychology, he says that a, a person doesn't move to the point of self-actualization unless their basic needs as a human person are met. Um, basically saying that uh, if you, uh, in, in our case, the self-actualization step that we want young people to uh, get to is that they decide their faith is their own and they have a relationship and a, and a commitment to a lifelong relationship with Christ and his church. That's a self-actualization step. When it's, it's not my parents' faith, it's not my catechist's faith, it's not my pastor's faith, it's my faith. Um, but according to Maslow, unless a person's basic needs are met, uh, they aren't going to get to that point. Uh, you can see this if you ever watch like a survivalist television show, uh, like for example, Survivor, which has been on for uh, like 40 seasons at this point. Uh, they, you see this when uh, people get on the island for the first time. I mean, the show's pretty famous. You, you, it's a game show. People vote each other off the island. They compete, et cetera. But the very first episode, they always do the same thing. The, the people get to the island and before they ever start like backstabbing each other and like making alliances and different things uh, in order to try to make sure that they don't get voted off the island, they look for food, water, fire, and shelter. And the first episode is always the same way. I mean, and if you think about it, like if you were stranded on a deserted island, your first thought, according to Maslow, would not be, uh, how do I get off this island? Like instinctually, your first thought is, I need to find food, water, fire, shelter. Uh, and unless those basic needs are met, you don't get to the point of self-actualization of now let me figure out how I can get off this island. It's the same thing that is happening with our young people today. Because our church is not meeting their basic needs, they're not getting to the point of self-actualization. And so when I worked for the Augustine Institute, we actually identified five needs that we felt um, every young person and really every human person at, needed to be met in order for a person to become a lifelong disciple. And that's that their church, they needed to know that they were understood, that they belonged. Uh, they needed to have a place where they could be transparent. They needed to be able to participate in critical thinking around faith and beliefs, and they needed um, guidance. And I'd love to go through all five of those, but uh, I go through it at length in my book, uh, and I only got about 20 minutes, so I, and I want to get into practical. So, but real quickly, um, it, it, you know, Joe talked in the, in the beginning in that video about the need for his players to trust him. Uh, and a person doesn't come to a point of trust unless they know that they're understood. Uh, and so young people, first and foremost, want to know when they come into the ministry or into the church, am I understood here? Um, can I trust the people that are in, in charge of me and have authority? Uh, do I trust that they understand me? Um, Young people also have a tremendous need for belonging. We all do. But if you uh, ever question, hey, why did a, a teenager who grew up in a really good, virtuous household, why does that teenager go in like to parties and binge drink all weekend? Why is it that they were raised with these great virtues by these great people and they abandoned those virtues? Um, like w what happened there? And the answer to that question, what I've, the conclusion I've come to is that uh, young people have such a tremendous need for belonging that they will abandon the virtues that they're raised with in order to find belonging. So if, if they think that the only place they can find belonging is uh, with people who party all the time, they're going to fall into that as well because they have just a tremendous need uh, for that sense of belonging. Um, it, you can see this 
uh, you can see it play out on, on a regular basis, but there is a, I had a train of thought there and I totally lost it. Um, young people, oh, you can see it, uh, it parents, uh, if you ever wonder why parents have overcommitted their teenagers to death with extracurricular activities today, um, it's because they know that their young people have a tremendous, that their child has a tremendous need to belong somewhere and their child finds a greater sense of belonging in on that soccer team or on that cheerleading squad or in that theater group. Um, they find more sense of belonging there than they do in their church. And so what is it that the parent prioritizes? Uh, because they have such fear that if they don't create a place for their child to belong and find good friendships, they know where they're going to go to find them. Uh, and so I, I don't blame parents when they overcommit their children. Uh, I, I know what they're trying to do. It's not what I want, but I'm saying it's a, it's a shame that you don't find that sense of belonging in your, ch your church. The parents are implicitly telling us if they prioritize everything else over church, that their kid doesn't find a sense of belonging there. We have a responsibility to create that sense of belonging. Um, young people have a need to be transparent. Everybody carries crosses. Everybody needs to be able to talk about their crosses. Otherwise, they internalize that. And, uh, and it becomes self-hatred. It becomes depression. It becomes uh, suicide, et cetera, um, or, or all kinds of unhealthy vices. Uh, so they have a need to, to find transparency. Uh, young people have a need for critical thinking around faith and beliefs. Now, this is really important. Critical thinking is different than being able to uh, simply be instructed in faith and beliefs. Critical thinking is they have a need to test it. They have a need to push back against it. They have a need to ask tough questions and have those questions answered. Uh, and th it makes sense because when you're a child, you will accept anything that an adult teaches you so long as you trust that adult. A second grader doesn't, uh, doesn't question what their teacher is, is teaching them. They just trust it to be true for the most part. A, a kindergartner doesn't question that their mom and dad are, are teaching them about Santa Claus. Um, be, they just trust it to be true. Uh, it isn't until they hit about the middle school ages that they uh, start to develop the capacity in their brain to critically think. And it's then that they start to say, you know, I don't know that it makes sense for Santa Claus to be real. I mean, how is it that a person lives on a North Pole with flying reindeer and he travels around to every like house in the world once a, a year and goes down their chimney and lives on a diet of milk and cookies and like delivers us toys that strangely look exactly like the toys that are uh, from Target, you know? Like there is a, there is, they start to realize that's not rational. And so they, they then ask the question, hey, is this real? They're, critically thinking. Is this real? Can I believe this? And then mom, so there is a, a, a reality that if they don't have a space where they can ask the tough questions and get those tough questions answered, they start to think that there are no good answers to my tough questions. Therefore, this isn't real and this isn't true. And I see that time and time again with young people today. They say the dogmas of the faith don't uh, apply to me or like uh, these questions about, for example, LGBT issues or things that they're learning or being exposed to. They have questions about that. Hey, what's the church's teaching? They don't get good answers on that. They start to say, uh, I'm not buying into this. Um, and, and that's, part of being a human person is we have a responsibility to give them good answers. In the Catholic Church, we, by the way, we do a tremendous job of answering questions that teens do not have. Um, we don't do a good job of answering the questions that they do have. And they're not going to ask those tough questions. They're not going to critically think and engage in that dialogue unless they feel like they have a sense of belonging and understanding first. Um, finally, young people have a need for guidance. If you look at the average schedule of an American teenager, they wake up in the morning, they uh, Go to, they go to extracurriculars before school. They then go to eight hours of school. They then have extracurriculars after school. They come home. Maybe mom and dad are home. Maybe they have a family meal. A lot of times they don't. They do two to three hours of homework. They go to bed. At what point during that schedule did they have a meaningful conversation with an adult? Nowhere. Uh, like there is a, a, this is not a church problem. This is not a, a religion problem. This is a cultural problem. In our American culture, we have removed the people that are responsible for raising up adults from the lives of young people. And so uh, rather than imitating as they're growing into adulthood and facing adult situations for the first time in their life, rather than imitating adults, they're imitating their peers because that's who they're around all the time. Uh, and so it's it's no wonder to me that young people make bad choices and aren't becoming the kinds of adults that we want them to be. Uh, young people have a tremendous need for guidance in their life, both from their parents and from other meaningful adults in their life. So we looked at 
when I worked for the Augusta Institute, we looked at, at this, uh, these five needs and we said, okay, let's look at the way we're doing ministry today with young people, either religion classes or youth group or, uh, or whatever the case may be. And we looked at it, we said, do, do our young people have a, a place where they feel like they can be understood or do they get lost in the masses? Do they find belonging? Do they have a place where they can be transparent? Do they have a place where they can critically think? Do they have a place for guidance? And in most of these cases, it was no, 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 no. This method doesn't meet these needs. And it was in a small group method though, that we said, you know what? Every single one of these uh, different points can be met which makes sense why the par when we shifted the paradigm, young people responded dramatically to it uh, in our ministry. Um, so I, do I, I go through these needs to make a selling point of, here's why small groups are imperative. If there was one thing I were to teach in terms of ministry to youth, it's that, um, look, the, the linchpin, like the, the difference between success and failure, in more, more times than not when I work with a young person, if a person becomes a lifelong follower of Christ, I ask them, who was an adult that inspired you in your, in your life and who's a couple of friends that are running alongside of you? And if they, if they are a lifelong follower of Christ, if they've got a, a devout, mature faith as a teenager, they always can answer those two questions. These are my couple of friends that are devout as well and that run alongside of me. And this is an adult that has been inspirational in my life. Uh, so. Um, I, I say, look, the, the youth groups, the, the retreats, the service, the conferences, the camps, the, the, uh, all this other stuff that we do, all of that is wonderful. It has a, a place in ministry to young people, um, but it is, not, it is supplemental to the most important thing, which is that young people need to have a place where they've got a, a few friends and an adult that's pouring into them, into their life. Uh, so what do you do when you work with young people? Uh, in our small groups, whenever I work with my small group leaders, I say, look, let's keep it really simple. I, I use the FOCUS method. Uh, FOCUS is the Fellowship of, of Catholic University Students. They teach their uh, missionaries who are on college campuses to just get two each year. Uh, focus in on a handful of young people, young adults, and they say you need to win them, you need to build them, and then you need to send them out to do the same to others. Uh, and so I... I say the same thing to my leaders is that it, look in the beginning with your small group uh when you're working with teenagers you got to spend the first amount of uh first steps that you're doing just winning them over and that can look like when i'm working with middle school boys for example i play with them a lot uh and sometimes our meetings are um are like <laughs> 50 minutes of playtime and like 10 minutes of faith development with them and and you might think oh well that that like you can't get into any substance that way no but uh, like you're right we don't get into a whole lot of depth but when, taking the time to actually win them over has a tremendous effect down down the road because once i know i've won the guys over uh, when we actually get to the build point they are like sponges and so then when i start doing bible studies with them when i start mentoring their prayer life i've earned their trust uh, because I've won them over, and then uh, they uh, absorb everything. Otherwise, it's like throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing if it sticks. It's like, let me walk, go through this curriculum that I have and, uh, and see exactly, um, because I know that you guys need to know this. And they're like, why should I care about this? I, you, don't, you don't care about me. You don't understand me. You don't belong. Uh, you don't give me a sense of belonging. Uh, you have to win the right to be heard first with young people. Um, then once you get into the build point, you can do anything with them. If you won the right to be heard, they'll follow you anywhere. Uh, and then finally, my goal is always to build them up with the purpose of sending them out. So at a certain point, we turn our focus into not just being formed in our faith, but also in reaching out and evangelizing to others and, and serving others and, and working for justice, et cetera. Uh, so those are just real simply like three steps that should always be the goal. Uh, when I was at a student at Franciscan University of Steubenville, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, famous for his, his like, teachings on, on applied biblical studies and and he's a very good biblical scholar and such he told our class uh he said you know what is the best uh evangelization tool that you'll ever have and we were thinking that he was going to say like the bible or like the rosary or something that, like you know very catholic like that he said the best evangelization tool that you'll ever have is pizza and beer <laughs> and and uh, he said that it is um, with that, like in breaking bread with others, uh, that you can start to earn the right to be heard with them. And it is in earning the right to be heard with them that then you can actually start to form them in wherever you want them to go. Um, as of a discipleship-focused youth ministry, uh, I find that my small groups, when either 
when I'm working with them or when I'm teaching my mentors to work with them, we focus on three things, which is relationships, prayer, and guidance. Now you might say, well, where's catechesis in that? Uh, catechesis is done throughout, uh, it, it, but it is not our main focus. And you might say, well, oh my gosh, like young people need to be catechized. And you're absolutely right. They do need to be catechized. But when I form a relationship with, with my young people, I let them um, basically uh, – uh, dictate where we go in our discussions. So I usually start with like a five week series on something and I ask them to give me five weeks and I take the time to, to build relationships with them and, and play with them and et cetera. Uh, and then uh, after we get to that point, they'll start asking questions and then I'll start picking my topics and my series or my uh, focus based on the questions that they have. And what's interesting is when you do that over the course of four years, you start to cover every aspect of the catechism and you don't necessarily do it in order or in a scope and sequence of a curriculum, uh, but you get into all the content of the faith when they start asking the questions. I'll give you an example. I took my small group to a Steubenville Youth Conference. This is an example of using Steubenville Youth Conferences to your advantage. Uh, we, you know, we went powerful holy hour. During the holy hour, uh, some kid behind us at an, with another group like started breaking out in tongues, which was really something that they hadn't experienced before. And I don't think that that teenager who had actually been there like started had experienced it before. So he, that teenager was having a very profound um, uh, encounter with with God in that moment. Uh, after the words, though, you can imagine my small group had a lot of questions. They were like, what the heck was going on with that? And so we op cracked open our Bible. We talked about Pentecost. We talked about the Holy Spirit. And they, they all said, I want to learn more about that. Like they were really interested. I said, great, you just gave me my topic for the next semester. Uh, and so the, for the next three months, we just went through the scriptures and talked about the Holy Spirit and relationship with the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit did uh, in, in the scriptures, what the Holy Spirit does today, how the Holy Spirit impacts us in the sacraments. And it was one of the most fruitful um, uh, minist like semesters I've ever had with, with young uh, men that I've worked with. They dictated where that conversation went. Next semester, we covered Mary, uh, because and we did all this the same kind of approach with Mary because it made sense to talk about the spouse of the Spirit after the fact. Um, so uh, we focus in on relationships, we focus in on prayer, and I focus in on guidance. Um, set uh, best practices for small group discipleship. So if you're wondering, okay, like all this sounds good, I want to be bought into this, but I've got. Uh, uh, you know, how do I actually implement this in, in our, our youth ministry? Uh, whether you have a large youth group or whether you have a non-existent parish ministry or whether you're at a Catholic school and you're a teacher or a catechist, whatever, wherever you're at, uh, I always recommend the same thing. I say start small and grow big. Uh, that um, I, I never recommend a parish start with 10 small groups. I say, look, don't stop doing what you're doing if you want to make a transition from, from the method that you're, you're currently utilizing. Um, take some time and start one small group. And, uh, and there's, ra there's a, a lot of different reasons for that, one of which is that it can be really hard to find the kinds of adult leaders that are competent um, with teenagers where they can articulate their faith and they can inspire people in the faith and they know how to pour into young people. Meaning that it's harder to find 20 of those people than it is to find two of those people. Um, so, and then secondly, if you start one small group, you can focus in on the, the time with that one small group with the right leaders or with you as the leader and focus in with those teens uh, and get it going strong and then those teens become the best uh, advocates to the other teens for here's why you should do small group ministry. This has been tremendously valuable in my life. Uh, and so they help you get the second and the third and the fourth group going. I've worked with some parishes that have only done one or two small groups, and that's as far as they got. I've worked with other Catholics. Uh, I've wor worked with a Catholic school that's currently at 30 small groups right now, all teenagers participating voluntarily. Um, and... Uh, so there is a, um, uh, but every single one of them started the same way, one small group at a time. Um, if you do the math on this, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, a lot of us think, okay, we've got to get to the big numbers, we've got to get to the big crowds. If you do the math on it, you say, okay, each season, so uh, fall, winter, spring, summer, I'm going to start one small group. That's like one every three months. And you do that starting with freshmen 
and every year a new freshman class comes in by and you have eight teenagers in a small group by the time four years have gone by and that first group gets to their last semester senior year you now have 16 small groups and over 100 teenagers in youth ministry and it all starts with just doing something really easy of starting one group at a time um so it grows rapidly that's the way the young church grew is that um the young church grew with small group ministry and grew rapidly from that uh Second step, uh, same gendered groups. Uh, I'm one of the few people that advocates for small group ministry with young people that will actually tell you that co-ed groups work. Um, that being said, uh, young men learn to become men from other men. Young women learn to become women from other women. Uh, you can get to a level of depth uh, in your ministry when, when you separate the, the two genders together. And also, particularly for when guys are younger, uh, girls mature faster than guys. That's not much of a surprise. Um, <laughs> girls mature faster than guys and so in particular if you're working with younger age teenagers I recommend separating out the genders because girls tend to go deeper faster than the guys do uh, the third thing I always say is that um, and this takes a little bit of practice but I teach my small group leaders to, to <clears throat> use Socratic methods so critical thinking questions um, uh, you're you're never gonna have a good discussion uh, with teenagers, if the questions that you ask them are, hey, what are your thoughts on the Holy Trinity? <laughs> they have no thoughts. On, <laughs> they have no thoughts on the Holy Trinity. Like, nor do their parents. Uh, what, yeah, nor, yeah, no. They, they're, or like, what, what, how can you live the virtue of chastity in your life today? That's not a discussion starter. Like a discussion starter is, um, hey, your friend Susie comes to you and she is, uh, has been dating her boyfriend for six months and her boyfriend um, wants to uh, engage in a sexual relationship with her. And your friend Susie's kind of on the fence because she kind of wants to, she kind of doesn't. What advice would you give her? That's a critical thinking question. That's the same question of, hey, what are your thoughts on chastity? But in, in the scenario in which I asked the question, um, every, I'm asking, what's your opinion? Now, every person's going to have an opinion on that. And some people's opinion might be, I tell Susie, go for it. But that still creates a discussion. Now we can discuss it and we can go back and forth on that. Um, those are the types of questions that I, that I utilize in my small groups to get uh, discussion going, uh, critical thinking questions. Our, my goal is always discussion. Uh, and, and we learn that way. For, uh, we talked about this a little bit last night, a comfortable environment. Uh, the turf of a teenager is uh, not uh, typically the church, although uh, Victor, who was on last night, was like, we have great success at a church. I'm like, great. Um, generally speaking, I would say uh, the, the rule of thumb is a comfortable environment. Uh, I've had success with teens in living rooms, in coffee shops, in parking lots, at parks, uh, in parishes, um, but a comfortable room. Um, and, uh, you know, the, generally speaking, you want to create an environment where the young people are going to be free to, are, are going to feel free to act like themselves. Um, small groups, uh, I recommend they meet with flexible scheduling. Uh, one of the tremendous advantages of small groups, if you have two, three, four, five small groups going uh, in, a, in a youth ministry, is they don't all have to meet on the same night. I've had groups that meet on Tuesday mornings before school. Uh, Friday nights, Saturday uh, or Sunday after masses, uh, you know, it, and what happens with that is that you actually create more flexibility for your ministry so that when people have extracurricular activities, you, you don't have to say to them, well, Wednesday nights are youth group night. And if you can't make it Wednesday night, that's it. Um, it you know, that's not being flexible for, for teen schedules. Uh, Number six, place teens in groups with their friends. The goal is to build relationships within the groups, relationships that are virtuous, uh, that build each other up, that uh, put Christ at the center. And I'd rather do that working with teens that are already friends than with teens that are total strangers. You could put me in a room of total strangers uh, that are adults and say, okay, now share intimately about your life. And I would say, no, <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not comfortable with that. I shouldn't expect a teenager to be the same, same way. Uh, let them pick their friends. Uh, it's actually a great selling point to come together. And then finally, uh, engaging parents. I'm always, um, I'm always 
uh, trying to get the parents involved in the process of small group ministry. That doesn't mean I'm asking them to lead the small groups themselves, but I'm asking them to host. I'm sending emails to them regularly and saying, this is what we're discussing. Uh, I, I'm trying to build relationships with the parents in, in and among that. Um, parents uh, should be your uh, advocates and your uh, help and support, and they should be aware of what it is that you're doing um, with their teenagers because they are, have more influence on their teens' lives than any of us ever will. Um, seeing a thumbs up there uh, from Stephen. All right, that's my 25 minute. Uh, I think I'm a little bit over 25 minutes. At well, this point. well done, well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and you were running the marathon, so if everyone was thinking, "Gosh, he's going fast," it's because I put the, I put, I pressed him, I pressed him. Plus, you're all veterans <laughs> here. You're all veterans. You, you all probably know what he just presented, but it was probably certainly fantastic to just see it. Now, now that I've let you take a, a sip of water, I have a few questions to throw at you. Is there any, uh, something that I, you and I have talked about and something that was is brought up in the chat room? And thank you guys for posting questions in the chat room. And in a second, I'll, I'll have you guys come off mics and we can kind of talk openly. But let's Uh, confirmation is essentially that uh, reduce the mandated stuff so as to allow yourself space to work in the area that's actually going to matter. Um, and so what you're sharing essentially is that I have so much mandated stuff and I'm saying, well, the ideal would be then to reduce the amount of mandated stuff that you have because uh, you want to work where the fruit is uh, and um, and on the stuff that really matters. Uh, so if, for example, when I work with people and they're like, they're confirmation coordinators, they're like, well, I've got to, we've got to do these service projects and we have two retreats a year and we got a weekly uh, curriculum that we've got to go through. I'm like, that's too much. Um, Cause all of your focus is on that and how much of that is actually making disciples. Um, like what, what of that really doesn't need to be done. Uh, and She's like, well, I got to sell my leadership on it because they love all of that stuff. I'm like, yeah, you do. Um, so you're going to have to sell them on dropping some of it because it's not, it's not the core of what's successful. But, but a no to that entitles and creates space for a yes to, you know, if you have 50 kids in a program that is mandatory picking four or five kids and working with them alone. So, yeah, I'll, uh, I, mean, I already see we're seven minutes over time, but, um, that uh, my friend Jim Beckman, who uh, is an outside the box thinker guy in Colorado, now he's in Oklahoma City, but uh, he was uh, previously a youth minister in Paris for 25 years. And eventually the youth ministers who took over were kids that came up through his program and they were doing a tremendous job. And they approached him and they said, well, you run a parent ministry simultaneous to our youth ministry. And he kept saying to them, no, 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 because they already had a parent ministry going and it was not that successful, but they would do like Jeff Caven's Bible studies with the parents while the kids were in youth group. And he kept saying, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that. And finally they went to him and they said, what would you do? Like what? He says, I would eliminate all your parent programs and I would work with eight parents or like four sets of, of two uh, couples. And, uh, and they were like, deal. Like whatever you want to do, do it. And he's like, great. And he, they got flack for, hey, where did the parent program go? You mean the parent program that most of you guys didn't go to? Like, <laughs> they got flack for it. Hey, where did that go? And and Jim worked with four couples. Now in that ministry, five years later, they've got more parents involved in cup because those couples were built up than to work with other couples who then subsequently worked with other couples. And they their parent ministry is now bigger than their youth ministry. Uh, so it, it's that kind of mindset that you have to get to. And it's, it's like, that's where my ministry is. is I'm trying to advocate for uh, the leadership in the Catholic church to get that kind of a mindset, work smaller so you can grow bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, 
couple pieces. This is Everett's book uh, that he's, he's covered a lot of. I've torn this thing apart, so I'm always up to discuss it. But the important thing is if you're interested in this, uh, text me or email me and I will send you a free copy or Rachel, I'll walk one down the hall to you. And then this is my new favorite thing. Uh, I have a few of these if you're interested. This is my new mask. Oh, it's a discussion starter. Yeah, it is. So wear this to Safeway and see what happens. So uh, we, we want to stay in the relationship business. Um, that's my dedication. Even though we have such a big diocese, I can stay in relation with everybody via Zoom now. So we'll be doing this monthly. I will bring a speaker in. Uh, so next month, uh, about October 14th, I will, uh, I will call us together again. And Everett has also said he could be available if we want to bring him back to say, hey, how'd the last month go? Did you try anything? So each month I'll be gathering us together. Uh, I know that all of our programs are kind of kicking off and so it eliminates being able to talk at like seven o'clock at night. So I'm thinking maybe we do coffee together in the future, something like that. Uh, we give thanks to God for this time. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, the, the time, Everett. I uh, appreciate you zooming in with us all the way from Denver. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, guys. We'll be in touch. Right. God bless.